Good morning. Good morning. Isn't that so encouraging? I think one of my favorite stories on there is Sister Mary Lucy Daniels. And it just goes to show that it does not matter how old you are, but everyone can have a part in the walk for life. And my name is Lenita Stutzman, and I'm here today to talk just a little bit about the Walk for Life. I get the privilege of volunteering on the Walk for Life team, and I really enjoy uh, this aspect of ministering to, as um, Dan said, those that don't have a voice. I just wanted to tell you a little bit about how we as a church did last year and where we are this year, because I think it's really exciting. But before I do that, by a show of hands, who has not yet received a Walk for Life brochure? Just raise your hand. And if you haven't received one, we would like to make sure that you get one, even if you don't think you're going to do the walk, just so you have the information. Does that mean everyone, oh, we got one right there, great. Anybody else that has not yet received one and would like one, just raise your hand and we've got a couple gentlemen in the back that will make sure that happens. But last year, First Church of Christ, we had 51 registered walkers on our team. We raised $9,493.21, which I think is phenomenal. So give your guys a hand. This year, as of yesterday afternoon, when I checked on Ministry Sync, we have 20 walkers, and we've already raised $2,015 which again, I think is phenomenal. So this year, the walk, as last year, is gonna be at Memorial Park, Saturday, September 17th. And if you are interested in being a walker and getting people to sponsor you, you can either register online, which all that information is on your brochure, or you can register, there's a little perforated tear-off tab, you can fill that out and hand that in to either myself or Ethne, or if you want, just to drop that off at the CareNet Center. Thank you, and keep getting those sponsors. Thank you, Anita. And I know many of you look forward to that and participate uh, each year. Uh, just want to welcome all of you. We gather here to worship the Lord and uh, give praise to the Heavenly Father. That's what we're about to do here collectively in just a few minutes. But uh, first, some other things that we need to take care of. One is a prayer shawl. You know how that works. There's a, there's a card there at the back. It's for Sophia Rubic, uh, an infant daughter of Nathan and Angie. The baby has multiple health problems, Down system, Down syndrome, heart valve issues, and uh, liver failure. It's a pretty serious situation. So let's uh, be uh, not just signing the card, but don't forget to pray uh, for this family and, and their uh, concerns at this time. Okay, uh, the other thing is, um, oh, harvest is coming up. We, we're all aware of that. And here's an interesting contribution to harvest. Mark Hosley has sweet corn. And you can go out to his place and pick up all you want for a donation to the harvest. Yes. So keep that in mind. Take advantage of that. If you like sweet corn, it sounds like a great deal to me. Um, Okay, I think that's all at this point. We're going to uh, look forward to uh, days to come as a congregation. And uh, I think you're all aware. Well, I was going to do this before I preach, but I'll, I'll do it right now. How many of you have read the first chapter of John? Oh, good. Several hands are going up. That's our, uh, our kind of our plan for the next few weeks. How many chapters in Chuck? Anyway? How many? 21. So 21 week period here. If it takes that long, maybe maybe it'll change before we get through all of that. But that's that's the concept. The elders and others of you that uh, are comfortable speaking from the pulpit will be involved. We're going to take one chapter each week, and today's chapter one. I'll be doing that, and then Lynn is going to be teaching a class during the Sunday school or the time between the two services on the book of John. Because you, you can't just cover one chapter in one sermon, generally speaking. So you'll kind of fill in the gaps and uh, just kind of have a continued thing going along. So then we encourage you to come prepared, read those chapters, kind of get an idea of what's coming up, and uh, that's what we'll be sharing. So 
I'll be bringing some thoughts from chapter one here later on. So I'll invite the worship team to come up and uh, we'll get ready to just lift our voices and pray. We'll be We're not right here. <laughs> How did you get up there without you seeing me? We're sneaky. <laughs> okay, let's turn it over to them. Please stand with us this morning as we worship the Lord. There's only the three of us here this morning. We have Leah and um, Brian is not here, but I'm going to ask you to help us out with some clapping. And for those of you who are musicians out there, you have permission to clap on one and three today because of this song. Otherwise, I don't usually allow that, but I saw the light.
thank you then from the very beginning. You are with us. You desire to be with us. Lord, we thank you for the blessings of life. Not only the good times, but the hard times and the challenges. You have been so good to us. We come now to give just a percentage of that back. The Lord tells us that the more we give, the more we receive in blessings. So Lord, as we think of the needs of the church, uh, the expenses, the projects that need to be completed, uh, we give generously as we can. We ask you to bless those gifts, multiply them, use them for the purposes of heaven. The Lord, we ask you, you've already promised us you will bless the giver. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to give back to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, everybody. We're thankful that you're here for session two of Making Room for Family. If this is your first time, we're thankful that you're here. I hope it's going to be a great experience for you. I know it will. And many of you, you're coming back. We're going to continue this conversation. It's a good one especially as we talk about family, which I know, Randy, is something that means a whole lot to you. And I'm wondering, why the deep conviction on this topic? Well, it's not just the subject of family. Uh, it's, it's really about this whole idea of coming to the table. You know, Columbia University did a study that really matches my conviction a, a, a couple of years ago, and they basically said, if you wanted to do one thing, just one activity, that would ensure that your children were off the streets and out of gangs and not engaged in premarital sex and drugs and alcohol, the one thing you could do is bring your family to the table five times a week. And you know what, Max, the reason I feel deeply about this is because our family started doing this about 13 years ago, and our kids are basically raised right now, and it's probably the number one thing that we're most thankful for. So I'm excited to, to introduce uh, this subject to our people and really offer it up to you as a suggestion as well. And boy, you're in for a treat because we're going into the Frazee household to see exactly how the Frazee family does this. And I've been to the Frazee dinner table. We're talking fun conversation. We're talking encouraging evenings. Most of all, we're talking good food. And I'm thinking there might be some leftovers. Yeah. No. No. You'll enjoy it. I'd like to tell you about my day, but not today. A day about 15 years ago. I woke up, got a shower, had an early morning breakfast, went to the office, worked hard every single second of the day, came home in the evening, had a brief dinner with my family, and then I don't know what else they did, but I know that I went back to my briefcase and continued to work. Uh, they went to bed, I kissed them goodnight, I shook off the slumber and went back to work again, and then I tried to go to sleep. On that particular night, I never went to sleep. I'm not talking about that I went to sleep and woke up. I never went to sleep at all. And that day recurred for the next 44 days in a row. And I hit rock bottom. You ask yourself, you know, what causes a person like me to be so passionate about a table? about bringing a family and friends around a table. I mean, it's just a meal. It's, it's way more than a meal for me. It really saved my life. I see it in the teaching of Jesus, but now I'm seeing it out of an absolute desperation. My doctor told me that I needed to find a way to put my work down and relax. And so we began to meet at the dinner table and I kept trying to find ways to extend it and we got into this whole idea of sharing your day, and I, and I would say to my son, linger, tell me more, tell me more, because uh, I, I need to learn how to relax. And over that experience that started as a crisis for me became one of the most beautiful expressions of belonging I've ever experienced in my life. So, yes, I'm passionate about the table experience, uh, but it really helped me, and I strongly believe that it can help you. I really, really do. family in the way that um, as we come, we eat more together. 
at our house and um, we, I guess, talk more than we normally do. Well, we always talk, but it's just more, I guess we talk about more of our days and how they went. The, the biggest impact that the tables had in my life you know, started back when I was a young girl. I mean, you noticed that I, the, the, my most favorite times that I remember growing up was the Sunday afternoon meal. And the reason I, I enjoyed that was because we were all there and we had my dad. My dad was a grocer who put in long hours, started early in the morning, came home late at night, almost at our bedtime. And my mom had kept something warm for him. And when he came home, we'd all come back to the dinner table to be with him. But on Sundays, he was there. He was with us. And we lingered around the table and just shared stories and laughed and told jokes and just really enjoyed that time. So the, di the, the dinner table was always very important to me. And I desired to do that growing up. And I learned that I liked to cook. And so therefore, it was even more important. But it was very difficult when we first got married because Randy worked long hours and, you know, the kids were little. And so he would come home and basically have a quick bite to eat with us and then go back to work for the rest of the evening. And so then that's when he went into the bath with sleep, with not being able to sleep. And the doctor basically told him that he needed to um, work from six to six and then enjoy his relationships and have dinner with his family and friends between six and 10 and go to, go to bed at the same time every night. So the table became very important to our family to give us a rhythm and to give him a reason not to go back to work. And as it evolved, uh, we started, we didn't know what to do at first when we had all this time. So to kind of linger around the table, we started, Randy came up with the idea of starting to share our day and unpack our day, which was very cool because that's when the kids started talking. And uh, we started listening and hearing it. And we can start a lot when kids are talking. If I didn't have the table to share my days, then I wouldn't have support from my family because they wouldn't know what I'm going through because I was not willing to uh, tell them up front. If I would describe the table in one word, I would say family. Um, because it's it's a family that I never really, uh, I didn't have before. And now I can't live without it. I enjoy bringing my daughter to the table, but I also enjoy coming because being a married lady now, I know she's with every, every moment of my family, so the chance of that is fun. The table's impacted me by um, just reinforcing that how important it is to do that, to sit down as a family and to share our days and just spend time with each other. September 4th through the 11th. I want to encourage you to pick up one of these cards that are back here on the table. And it just says, uh, be intentional about building relationships in your neighborhood. And boy, that hits me pretty hard. You know, I, my friend is on recently just lives next door to us. And we, we cross paths quite often. Well, not a lot. But you know, uh, We've never invited them to our homes. Shame on us. And we think about this. So think about neighbors in your neighborhood, or friends in your neighborhood, or you know, where is the neighbor? It might not even be close to you. But here's some ideas. It says, this week we're encouraging everyone to make connections with people that live around you. Make a phone call, invite them for ice cream, have a picnic, go for a walk, a bike ride, invite them to sit on your porch, have a bonfire, etc. Be creative, but connect with those around you in your neighborhood. So on Sunday, September 11th, they're planning to pop up here after the second service, giving you an opportunity to invite some of the connections you might make to be here with us that Sunday morning. So that's the plan. And so pick one of these up as you leave. Okay, children can be dismissed uh, for Children's Church and the workers along with them. 
you can make your way to uh, the fellow Brenda there and whoever else is involved in that ministry. And then uh, th this is a part of the sermon. But I want to take this opportunity to share with you the experiences uh, or just uh, kind of an insight a little bit last November. Um, and how God answered prayer. I had that tingle that I bent over one day and had a word behind my shoes and my shoulders threw down the tips of my fingers. Oh my God. Oh my God. And, you know, pain that stood up there by the way. And it happened again. So I cornered my friend Roger on Wednesday morning and said, what's going on? He said, Rosa, I think you better have a stress test. Oh, my heart. Uh, call your doctor. If he can't get you in, I will. Or I'll try to get you in. So I thought about that, and so I made an appointment. Tuesday night, I sat down with my doctor and explained uh, what Roger said. He said, I think Roger's giving you good advice. And he said, uh, I can get you in tomorrow morning. Okay, we'll do that. So that kind of stirred some concern. And uh, through this whole process, Rebecca and I prayed together that uh, God would just, just go before us. So on a stress test, I want to know that Dr. Ryder said, well, can you run? I said, well, I think so. <laughs> Well, he said that treadmill is really a more accurate test than, than a chemical. Thing. So I'm on the treadmill, and I think I'm doing pretty great. And this is reading off those numbers mean nothing to me. And uh, I'll get a little tired by the time we're done. I'll get a little heavy. And the nurse says, Well, Russ, before it's in the out the door, I think I want the doctor to look at this. So that was the first indication that something was going on. So I sat down with the cardiologist just a few minutes after that. and. Uh, he explained what the deal was, and had those blockages and all of that. And, and uh, I just simply said, uh, he said, and, and, but they don't know where they are and how many, you know, just with that stress test. So yeah, I said, well, what do you recommend? He said, he had a catheterization. He said, uh, I can do that tomorrow morning. Ooh. Okay, let's, let's do it. So we're heading for Eau Claire, thinking that uh, they'll probably put in a stint. You know, they did that eight years ago. And so we get down there, and uh, they go through the procedure. And uh, during the, when I'm in the camp lab, Rebecca, of course, is by herself. She's, you know, she's not really too concerned. And all of a sudden, she heard, cold blue, camp lab, cold blue, camp lab, cold blue. Well, that concerned her, to say the least. And uh, then Sarah Lamp, the nurse, come in and said, yes, that was your husband, but he's okay now. We got his heart started. So then they got through all of that, and after that was done, then the surgeon comes in, and um, the, the, the cardiologist, and, and he's a black man, and uh, this related really well to him right away. Anyway, he, he writes on the, on the board there on the wall. Well, he says, we, well, he drew the heart, showed me where the blockages were. And he says, we got three options, number one, number two, number three. Number one, I said, uh, that's, we we'll, won't we'll do anything, but that's not really an option, and he erases that. <laughs> Number two, he says, we can put in a stint, but that will be temporary. And uh, number three, he said it would be triple bypass. And he said, uh, do you and your wife, Rebecca, want to think about this? And I said, no, I don't think we have to. I said, when can you do it? Tomorrow morning. So there. That's how God prepared them. I, I'm not going to... I had some fun times with those nurses, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> but the staff was really great. And, uh, I just had to check out here. Put it I just had a check out last week. Talked it, everything's going fine. And uh, I said, well, I had a little more tingling in my legs. And he said, well, I check that out real quick and they did that with some procedure that uh, I didn't understand 
anyway, they said, well, cut the circle in the time, point it in your ankles and your feet, so that part is good. So, but I just, I, I've shared that with some people, you know, uh, sometimes we, we just forget, you know, we worry a lot, or we have time to, you know, that, that just one, two, three, and I believe that, uh, <coughs> That was God's answer for it. Well, uh, John, and why am I out here to bless my fellow elders? Uh, <laughs> we decided and together, you know, that yeah, this would be a good idea to just use the elders and some of the others, you know, like Shelby back here and, and Gary and those that can preach and, and share and then and we go through the book of John. And uh and Ted says, Well us. Why don't you leave the way? I mean, people are used to you. <laughs> well, it's been quite a while. And, uh, but anyway, that was how that all came about. So I'm here today, and we'll get a little bit into the, the job here. And then uh, Lynn comes up with this idea about having this class. And the elder said, wow, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And kind of get involved in the whole content of what we do. And uh, he said, really, I'm a, I'm a teacher, I'm not a preacher. And I said, Lynn, if you want to do that, I'll preach. Then we'll schedule for next week. I said, I'll preach for you next week, and you're free to teach. So I said, you're going to have to put up me two Sundays here in a row. And then uh, we'll get some others here in the pulpit to continue. So, uh, let's turn to John, chapter 1. Oh, by the way, uh, it just wasn't our prayer. I know the prayers of many people. Uh, cards and visits and uh, some of you know Atapa. Atapa sent an email when he heard that I was going to drill this. Well, if you get to your NIV, most of you do. I just want you to take a quick look at this. Um, they've divided it into paragraphs for us with some headings. And as we go through the first um, well, the first first one is if the word became flesh, and we could spend a lot of time dealing with that. But that's that's verses one through eighteen. Uh, the word became flesh, and then John the Baptist comes on the scene, and he has a testimony regarding Jesus. He had a role and mission to fulfill, and when asked who he was, he did not hesitate to say that he was not the Christ, he was not Elijah, he was not a prophet, but simply a voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. And then, of course, it was the next about the Jesus, the Lamb of God. Then it was John the Baptist to see Jesus coming the next day. And he proclaims, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the earth. And then he said, I have seen and testify that this is the Son of God. And then the latter part of the chapter, we see Jesus calling his first disciples. Calling uh, 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 Peter and his brother Andrew, Philip, and his brother Nathaniel. But we're going to go back and uh, visit some of those first verses there. And, and Lynn shared some of that in, in the meditation this morning, kind of getting our thoughts in line along with that. And that was great. But I just wanted to emphasize that God is the source of life and light. So in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And through Him all things were made. We'll talk a little bit about that. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. And then in him was life, and that light was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood. God is the source of life, both physical and spiritual. I think we know that. Genesis 2, verse 7. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Luke writes in Acts 17, Just the God who made this world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything, because he himself gives men life and breath and everything else. Jesus makes a statement that 
John records in the sixth chapter of his book, for the bread of life is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And then the statement of Jesus himself, I am come that they may have life and have it to the full. I want to emphasize this morning that that life is available, of course, but that life is in Jesus Christ. On occasion, Jesus made this statement uh, in John 5, it's recorded to those around him. He says, you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. Now, I'm not certainly saying that we ought to study the word, but it's this. These are the scriptures that testify about me, Jesus said. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. So we can be avid readers of scripture, but that in itself is not the purpose for which the word was given. It was to lead us to the life of the Lord Jesus. <coughs> and, of course, such uh, life is... Uh, well, let me share one other one. Um, in 1 John 5, again, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son, and he who has the Son has life, and he who does not have the Son does not have life. So that whole relationship, that whole realm of light and, and life is given as a gift. Romans 6.23, a verse that many of us could quote, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And John writes again in his epistle, he says, And this is what he has promised us, even eternal life. Well, then we get into the concept that this life, in verse 4 of our text there, was the light of men. So Jesus in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. That's Jesus existing, that's, that's the Trinity, that's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we have Jesus was the Word, and then he has life, which he came to give, and now he is the light. A little bit of a progression there. The power of God is shown in creation. Romans 1.20 says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible quality, that is his power, eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. However, it was this life, this life of Jesus, that brought mankind to focus upon the righteousness of God, to understand his love, his grace, his mercy, to know of his compassion and his concern for man, and more importantly, perhaps, to give light into the heart and the mind of man so we might know how we ought to live in order to enjoy the blessings of God. So we're called to live in the light. I appreciate the song that 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 show was this morning. You know, I saw the light. I saw the light. That that's so critical in our relationship with Him. We are called to live in that light with the knowledge and the understanding and the awareness of God that such light reveals. So then we get into verses such as this. Romans or Ephesians five says, "For you were once darkness prior to the relationship with Christ, but now you were light in the Lord." Live as children of light, for the fruit of life consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And then Paul went on to say, find out what pleases the Lord, and have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. First Thessalonians chapter 5, again the writings of Paul, but you, brothers, are not in darkness, so that this day should surprise you like a thief. He was thinking in terms of the, the second coming. You are all sons of the light, sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like the others 
who are asleep. Let us be alert. Let us be self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a covenant. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. And therefore, Paul says, encourage one another. Build each other up, just in fact, as you are doing. Peter has this insight. He said, you are a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you might declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Well then, verse 6, there was a man who was sent from God, his name was John, John the Baptist. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him, the one who is the light, all men might believe. Now, he himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Not artificial, not temporary, not a, a false witness or a false light, not even just information concerning the light, but the real thing. Jesus, the Word, in Him was life, and that life, or that life was the light of man. The true light that gives to every man was come into the world. So, then we find out I'll be perfect to this. Isn't it a good feeling to be uh, remembered, to be recognized? A visitor comes into our assembly here, let's say on Sunday morning for the second time, and he or she is met at the door by our greeters and welcomed by name in appreciation for their uh, second visit. That's a good feeling. Believe me, I've been there and experienced that as we have visited some churches over the course of our years here in ministry. But on the other hand, what a disappointment to work hard, to achieve a certain goal, to achieve, achieve success at a particular skill, maybe to excel in a particular area, and no one notices, no one mentions it, no one expresses appreciation or congratulations. No one encourages you. No one recognizes you for what you've done, for who you are, what a letdown. What a disappointment. What a, what a discouragement. Don't get verse 10. He was in the world. And though the world was made by him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. He should have been recognized. He came to our world, an event in the history of mankind that reveals how important this world was to God, the Father, and to His Son, the Lord Jesus. His visit was foretold by the prophets. It was foreshadowed by the Jewish priests in the fulfillment of their duties. And it was kept before the people by, the, by divine order of all of the whole sacrificial system. <coughs> the fact of his coming into this world is most important to us. 
as nothing would satisfy the needs of the human nature more than the appearance of God among men. And in turn, the justice of God could never have been satisfied without the perfect sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for the man without sin. And if he made the world, and he did, there's no argument there. Through him all things were made. And without him, nothing was made that has been made. In some of our most of reading from Rebecca, now we've come across some, some thoughts regarding creation. And, and scientific evidence and the astronomers and the astrologists and all of this, uh, the astronomers and all of this kind of stuff. And that a group of individuals so dedicated to those areas of study. There's an increasing number who have come to acknowledge the Creator. Um, just as John says here. And that's encouraging. That's, and and there's, there's a lot of reason in thinking that we were reading that, and I said something to Rebecca, I guess she's sure someone said, you're not going to preach a sermon on science, are you? <laughs> no, I better not do that. I'm not still to do that, but, but just thinking about that and, and then getting into this about how God has, has made the world. And without Him, without the Trinity there, there was nothing made that has made. So as God the Son was involved in creation, and understand that creative power is the sole prerogative of divinity. He had a perfect right to come to us as He did. He didn't come as an intruder. He didn't come as a uh, as an infringer of any right. He didn't come as an outsider or as a transgressor of any law. He came as the one and only Son, the living God. He came as the Word. He came as life. He came as the light through which we could be forgiven of our sin, restored as a member of the family of God, and given that promise of the new heaven and the new earth forever. But what a gross injustice to the Savior to be unrecognized by the world and rejected by his own. And of course, that's past history. But what about today? What about today as a nation? We sometimes just wonder what in the world is going on in the hearts and minds of the Jewish people as, 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 a, as a group of a body of people, a nation, uh, in their rejection of the Messiah. I think we're all aware, I don't intend to get into details there either, but of the direction that our culture today is moving. And I, I, I heard just a clip from WWID this last week of, of uh, a replay of Chuck Olson and, and Breakpoint. I said, when a nation comes to put more trust in government than they do in God, So we're getting close to that. But anyway, uh, and here's some other thoughts. These weren't originally, but I, I understand it. I think I do anyway. Uh, the minority are often right and the majority wrong. The minority generally are the first to accept great truth. So it's better to be with the minority when right than with the majority when wrong. And so we should be thankful to the minority that did receive the Savior, even more thankful to our Lord for not leaving this world in disgust and, and heartbroken and when he was rejected by his own. So these thoughts as, as we just conclude and, and uh, I want to say that I'm trying to honor a directive I was given about preaching this morning. I won't say who it is. Well, his first name is Tim. <laughs> <laughs> he said, keep it simple and short. <laughs> you can do that with Tim, that'll love you. You probably don't. But anyway, okay, so this is these thoughts. I, I just ask, have you recognized Jesus for who he is and what he has done? Have you given praise to the Father 
for sending his son? Has your tongue publicly confessed your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus? And are you, are we, am I, are we living in a way, or the way we live, I want to put it, the way we live, is that a living testimony to the fact of your recognition and your acceptance of Jesus? The people of his day missed the blessing of God for their failure to recognize and receive it. And it's the same today. We do not enjoy the blessings of a gift unless we receive it, and we do not live in the light unless we choose to do so. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the word, for the light, you have given. And Father, sometimes we stumble around in uh, dimness, perhaps, not fully understanding. But Father, you've been so patient. You have been working with us, walking beside us, enabling us to see more and more, to live a life that glorifies you in greater ways. We have a deeper understanding of your love and grace and mercy to us. And so, Father, we thank you for that today. And we thank you for the gift that all of these involved that you have offered to us. And so help us that we might uh, live in such a way that not only are we living and walking in the light, but that light can become a blessing to others. And Father, as we think of God, uh, friends and family week and reaching out and this video we had here of our four together on the country. Lord, might that be an opportunity for us to share the light, the strength of the light, and Father to be a blessing to those I thank you, Father, for this congregation. I thank you, Father, for this history. And we look forward to the future with confidence and assurance. You are our God. Your son is our Lord. Your Holy Spirit in Moses, help us Lord to be faithful and to be honoring and serving and living and walking.